Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. All right, you guys, Scott Horton Show. Check out the archives at scotthorton.org and at libertarianinstitute.org slash scotthortonshow. You can follow me on Twitter at scotthortonshow. All right, introducing Ted Postal. He is a professor emeritus of science, technology, and national security policy at MIT. His main expertise is in ballistic missiles, but he also has substantial background in air dispersal. And he has taught courses on weapons of mass destruction, including chemical and biological threats at MIT. Uh, Formerly worked as an analyst at the Office of Technology Assessment, as a science and policy advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations, and as a researcher at Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, you're probably familiar uh, with the fact, listeners of this show anyway, uh, regular listeners, that he was involved in the debate over the sarin attack in uh, Gouda in eastern Damascus in 2013. And now there's another alleged sarin attack in Syria, this one that took place on April the 4th. And Ted has again chimed in uh, with uh, his analysis of events. There are, I believe there's three parts now. I couldn't find the third, but I saw the headline somewhere before. Uh, but I know you can find at least the first two at uns.com and also at Zero Hedge. And am I right about that, Ted? Welcome to the show. Is there a third part of this report now? Uh, yes, there's now five report. Well, five, and uh, I posted something. Well, I didn't post it. I s- sent it out yesterday, and I'm sure it's posted by now. Okay. So... All right, so five of them. I'm, I'm going to have to catch up. Please forgive me. I'm way behind. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> All right, let's let's start I'm, with. I'm way exhausted. <laughs> sure. I, I bet you. Are, well, and I bet you know just exactly which parts of it you want to talk about by now too, with all the interviews sure. you've been doing. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, so yeah, April fourth, um, there was an attack. Uh, some other things happened, and then the White House put out a report saying, here's why we believe that the Syrian government dropped a bomb from the air that was full of, uh, I don't want to paraphrase, they they said they made some claims about some chemical weapons. I don't know if they say exactly sarin or sarin-like, what have you, the exact quote. Uh, But they say there was a gas bomb dropped by the Syrian government. It was responsible for these scores of deaths here. And then that was when you started writing and said that this report does is not credible and and it does they do not provide evidence to substantiate their claims in this report that seems like probably the best place to start this debate is that right right, right. I, yeah i would say well i'm saying uh, the, the the i don't believe that this report uh was uh, done by any competent intelligence uh, people this report has the appearance of it being constructed by a group of amateurs probably at the National Security Council, and it refers to evidence that can be looked at. So um, when you look at the evidence, uh, which is uh, an alleged uh, crater where sarin was supposed to have been released from an airdrop munition, it is absolutely unambiguously clear that there was no airdrop munition that dispensed anything. Uh, All that is in the crater is a um, uh, a tube that's probably from, well, that's usually used to manufacture 122 millimeter rockets. It's, uh, the tube is crushed from the outside. So if it was for, for sarin dispersal, it, it, it had to have been crushed from some kind of external force, not an internal force. Typically, what you do when you're uh, dispensing something like sarin is you would have the liquid. It's, it's a liquid. It has the appearance of water. It's odorless and colorless. And you would have a, a very small explosive charge inside the container to just rupture the container and cause the sarin to uh, disperse. And... Um, 
this this uh, uh, pipe is crushed from the outside. So the only way it might have been used as a sarin dispersal device, which incidentally I, I don't believe it is, would be if you placed an explosive outside, you know, by it, you know, next to the tube, and maybe put a big rock on top of the explosive to to project the um, the explosive um, pressure wave uh, toward the um, uh, toward the um, uh, tube and crush the tube from the outside with the explosive. Uh, but that's not what the um, White House claimed. They claimed there was an airdrop munition, and uh, there's no evidence for anything that looks like an airdrop munition at this site. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I should add that uh, uh, my colleague uh, Richard Lloyd and I in 2013 were the first to identify uh, the the munition that was used in the attacks on uh, in Damascus. And uh, uh, there was an article published about our finding in the uh, New York Times and uh, two weeks later, uh, the UN had finally was able to get in, and they published uh, their findings, which were exactly exactly the same as ours, but two weeks later. So uh, you know, so I have some experience identifying these, mm-hmm. <coughs> you know, these munitions. And to clarify what you're saying about this, you're saying the pipe in the pictures, and I've seen the pipe that you're talking about here, and it does look. <clears throat> I understand what you're saying when you say it looks like. There was an explosive, uh, an explosion took place outside of this tube that smashed it down and right. w- would have at least, you know, ostensibly released whatever was in there, poison gas or otherwise, this kind of thing. But just if I can misparaphrase you and so you can straighten me out here, are you saying that if this had been a bomb of any kind <laughs> dropped from a fighter plane that it wouldn't look anything like that. You wouldn't have a tube like this of any description. You would have something altogether different in terms exactly. of shrapnel, whatever bomb fragments left over. Exactly. And in fact, if you had had a, a bomb that was designed to uh, disperse um, a sarin, you would have casing materials all over the place because the bomb would have some kind of small explosive in it and, would, and and the explosive would shatter the outer shell of the bomb and disperse the sarin. Right, that makes sense. So okay, you, but And I'm sorry because I know this is into the realm of speculation here, but it seems kind of strange too, though, that, that it would make sense for them. I mean, I agree with you that it doesn't really make sense that sarin or anything else was actually released from that too, but it seems like a funny way to stage... Uh, crime scene as well that you know yeah see it was a sarin attack look at this tube that then they smashed from the outside with an explosive of some kind uh, when as you're saying that's not what an airdrop bomb would look like but I guess close enough for a day's work on CNN that kind of thing or well I think uh, the fact that the White House report identified this crater as it did and I was able to go and find the uh uh, the, the journalistic uh, videos and photographs of the uh, uh, of the crater, due to, due to the White House pointing to it, uh, indicates that there was absolutely no attempt to get uh, a competent professional intelligence review of this White House report that alleges to be an intelligence report. Nobody competent, nobody at all. Uh, would uh, certify the, that this this uh, intelligence report is competently done, and uh, and I think there are very serious questions about uh, why this report was released because it's obviously not an intelligence report; it's falsely represented as an intelligence report. So I think this is quite serious. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually talked with Phil Giraldi today, the former CIA officer, and he says that there are people inside the intelligence services who are really upset about this and the way that it's been uh, misrepresented. So, well, we have these uh, very hardworking, uh, you know, quite servants of the American people in the intelligence community. I've criticized the intelligence community myself from time to time, but these are big organizations. I know people who've been involved. 
these are very, uh, you know, many of these people are very good and very dedicated, and they're being used as a uh, fall, you know, as uh, as an instrument of what looks like uh, political manipulation. Mm. So if I were in their position, I would be very upset myself. I am upset, and I'm not in their position. Yeah. Well, now, so is there, I mean, really, this picture itself could be staged. I mean, they could have got this pipe and hammered it out, uh, you know, a month yeah. ago yeah. and only just dropped it here. Uh, is there any other evidence, staged or otherwise, of any other shrapnel or any other uh, bomb fragments around that crater, or this is it? That they're showing us. Well, this is it. In fact, uh-huh. there are earlier photographs of the crater relative to the diagram, the, the photograph I used in my earliest report. Mm-hmm. The photograph I used in my earliest report was published by The Guardian in an article on April 6. And um, I went back and uh, looked at all the video that I could find. And there are earlier renditions of that crater and it looks like that particular piece of metal that is lying flat in the crater in the photograph that I first used uh, is not what the crater looked like initially. It looked like this pipe was vertically uh, in the ground uh, within the crater and then there are definitely, I I mean I have video of uh, people coming and pulling this thing out of the ground and digging around the crater. So the crater, uh, the, the image of the crater that was shown in, in the Guardian article uh, published on April 6, uh, was in fact an image that was tampered. The crater had already been tampered with. Mm. And as I said in my first piece, uh, that nobody who was competent would have assumed that the crater was not tampered with. And in fact, I was very careful to point that out, that right. I'm assuming the crater was not tampered with, uh, which I think is not a good assumption. And under those conditions, this is what you would guess happened. Right. And now it turns out that the, the, the crater was, was tampered with beyond that. Hmm. Well, all right. Now, um, I admit I have not uh, gone and tried to give a fair hearing to the Bellingcat version of all of this, which I'm sure is that Assad did it. I don't, I don't even need to look at the site to know that. But I did see a couple of tweets where the Bellingcat people were saying, look, this pipe has a green stripe on it. And where do you see a pipe with a green stripe? Russian chemical <laughs> weapons. <laughs> I'm is that your that only comment, laughter? I, well, uh, you know, I've... Uh, uh, my... Uh, Colleague Dick Lloyd and I tried to work with Bellingcat uh, during the 2013 uh, attack, and uh, they, uh, uh, in particular, um, uh, they, they did not know anything about the science and technology of these devices. When uh, we first identified the munition, they had no idea what we were talking about. When we pointed out that the munition uh, could not fly at a long range in, in the 2013 attack and had to have been launched within rebel-controlled areas as defined uh, by the White, a White House map that was supposedly part of an intelligence released by the White House. Bellingcat started inventing, inv- inventing uh, uh, information that there were Syrian troops really operating in within, within the rebel-controlled areas. They didn't understand the, the most basic elementary aspects of how a rocket flies. They were trying to raise questions about our analysis. It was just like, um, it was like, tr- I mean, actually, I've, I've discussed, I, I pride myself in, in, in with being able to explain these things. And I would say that uh, I could have done better with a, a rather young child relative to what they uh, s- seemed to be able to understand. And then, of all things, there was this, uh, this other uh, character who's associated with them, Mr. Daniel Cazetta. And he was running around claiming that hexamine uh, th- was in the uh, samples that the UN found, and this was a clear indicator that um, 
that the sarin uh, was manufactured by the Syrian government. Of course, hexamine is a byproduct of an explosive. And there's hexamine all over the place there because there are explosives all over the place that have been detonated. So then he claimed that uh, Aka Selstrom, the UN um, uh, team leader of the inspection team, had ver- had told him that he was right with with the uh, uh, this allegation that hexamine was unique to Syrian uh, uh, nerve agent. And uh, uh, I wrote uh, Professor uh, Selestrom, and he was very gracious uh, getting back to me. And he told me that uh, he had never said such a thing. So uh, you know, I wrote up a long, uh, I wrote up a rather detailed. Uh, document about Mr. Cazetta and uh, uh, his uh, his friend at uh, Bell and Cat, Elliot Higgins, and I published it. All, you know, it's available anywhere if people look it up. And uh, basically, uh, these guys are frauds. They are they are people who have manufactured uh, credentials that they don't have. I went and looked at Mr. Cazetta's uh, alleged expert publications. The closest thing he did, uh, he has uh, to his record of a, of a publication uh, about nerve agents, is a manual about what you do if there's a release, how to clean up the area, and how to handle the materials. You, you, you know, it's not even clear the, the his publication isn't just simply copied from other publications. There's nothing special about it that would make him, uh, you know, indicate that he's a true. Uh, a, a true expert on ner- nerve agent. He was talking about the chemistry of manufacturing the nerve agents, and he had no idea what he was talking about. The chemistry turned out to be all wrong. So um, I would say that Bellingcat is 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 less than a bunch of amateurs. They are they are really a, a bunch of frauds. And um, I must say I'm very uh, disturbed by the press continuing to use uh, them as a source for information when the press has to know if it did any work at all that these guys have been shown in detail to be frauds so uh, you know to me this is uh, this is as much a statement as the as the as the uh, about the media as it is about these these guys at Bellingcat that the media hasn't done the simplest amount of homework to look up this document that I produced, which you know uh, would would be um, you know it would be slander if the facts in it weren't absolutely correct, and 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 so you know and I'm I'm, I'm waiting for the slander suit. Huh? Yeah, I mean they, this guy Cazetta was threatening me with slander. I said, please do, you know, because if you <laughs> if you try anything, I'll make sure that you pay a higher price that you pay a high price for it because. That's a false allegation. All right. Well, let me uh, stop you there for a second and turn it around on you because, hey, MIT, that sounds pretty impressive. Uh, And I'm reading your bio here at Zero Hedge. It says that uh, you have a substantial background in air dispersal, including how toxic plumes move in the air. So that sure sounds like an impressive credential beyond uh, Bell and Cat level. But can you elaborate, please, and tell us what exactly that means? Uh, well, I, I I don't know what it means, quite frankly. I'm I, I'm a scientist by training, and uh, you know, lots of things have been said about me that, quite frankly, I think are inflated. I mean, I I, I think I, I mean, I can show that I know what I'm doing, but uh, you know, it's just a it's just a you know I, you know, you uh, I was teaching a course where I needed to discuss chemicals and biological agents, so I uh, sat down and learned about air dispersal. You know, this is what a good scientist should be able to do. So my expertise comes from, you know, reviewing published documents and uh, uh, learning about the ins and outs of how to make an estimate. And, uh, you know, I I wouldn't say, you know, I haven't gone to school over it, but I'm pretty sure that I know as much as anybody who did go to school over it. And, um, you know, so uh, I'm not the world's leading Ballistic missile expert. I know quite a bit about ballistic missiles, as uh, but I've been portrayed as that as well. And I, I'm quite honestly, I don't know where these things are coming from. What I can say 
is that I have a very substantial technical background in this area. <clears throat> I have published over many decades technical works, many of which were different from what the mainstream believed was the, was the situation. And in every case where uh, there was an investigation, <clears throat> I was proven correct. So that sh seems to me should be enough. I mean, uh, you know, there, you, being a faculty member at an institution like MIT should indicate that the person has the ability to learn uh, about, you know, as they move forward. And that's what's going on. You know, that's, that's all I've done is apply things I've learned over the years. Hey, I'll check out the audiobook of Lou Rockwell's Fascism Versus Capitalism, narrated by me, Scott Horton, at audible.com. It's a great collection of his essays and speeches on the important tradition of liberty. From medieval history to the Ron Paul Revolution, Rockwell blasts our status enemies, profiles our greatest libertarian heroes, and prescribes the path forward in the battle against Leviathan. Fascism Versus Capitalism by Lou Rockwell for audiobook. Find it at Audible, Amazon, iTunes, or just click in the right margin of my website at scotthorton.org. Right. And, uh, well, and I guess we'll see whether, you know, other air dispersal uh, experts want to dispute your claims. I haven't heard that anyone's tried yet. I don't see but, there's anything to dispute. We, yeah. we know. Well, I want to ask you about the what you wrote here. And, and I'm sorry, because I've only read two of the five oh, pieces okay. now. But you, hey, you can you address the wind? Because you, you go over the weather report and the sunrise and everything here about, you know, if if the gas did come from here, which way it would have gone and and how long it would have lingered, and all these things that you divine here. Well, basi basically, um, incidentally, I initially got the wind direction wrong by 180 degrees. <laughs> so, so my joke with a farmer friend of mine is I, I can't tell which way the wind is blowing. So, but uh, well, we'll I, be I, careful. I, mis I misunderstood the definition of wind direction, but that that's that's all been corrected. Uh, so we know, uh, we know pretty much what where the average uh, general winds were blowing at the time of the alleged release and it was the wind would have carried uh, the uh, the sarin assuming there was a release uh, to the um, to the east northeast we, and I, I have diagrams laid out in the reports so anyone who's interested could look and there is a, a populated area immediately next to this alleged sarin release site. So that should have been the area, assuming there was a release, where there would have been a large number of casualties. Those casualties would have been generated sometime, perhaps between 7.20 and 7.30 in the morning. The attack was supposed to have begun, was the, the munition was dropped supposedly according to the White House, at 6.55 a.m., they, they have uh, three decimal places precision, but let's say 7 a.m., the, uh, the, the uh, sarin uh, dispersal cloud, which incidentally I do not believe existed, but let's just take the White House report uh, literally, um, the sarin release cloud would have drifted into a, a heavily populated area uh, within... Uh, a few minutes of, of the dispersal, uh, it would have taken a few more minutes to disperse. You know, the, it's a very low wind that would maybe one or two meters per second. So a slow walk, it, it would be drifting at that rate. It would have to, you know, it would drift up against houses. So, so some, of it, some of it would drift downward, perhaps into a basement, an open basement window where people could be poisoned. Some of it would drift into the windows of houses that are facing in the direction of the wind. Some of it would have gone up or down alleys and over roofs. You know, it would have been a very gentle process because the wind would be gently pushing it. So within, uh, you know, let's say five or ten minutes, uh, people would start feeling the consequences of sarin poisoning. Uh, some people who are in intense uh, regions would have pretty much died within a couple of minutes. Other people might have gotten very low doses of sarin, but they would have had symptoms. So they would have been nauseated, vomiting, uh, dizzy, 
disoriented, things of these are symptoms of low levels of sarin poisoning. And you would expect that there would probably have been a general panic because people would have been aware, people who were not killed would have been aware that other people were, uh, were uh, showing similar symptoms. People would be, some people would be dead. And all of this would play out, let's say, by 7.30. So by 7.30, there, there should be people dead, over, dead within this area. There's no evidence of any kind of photography of dead people in, in, an area, in this area. None at all. The only thing you have from journalists, multiple journalists, who were at this crater are, pe- are the journalists showing you the crater, which is not where an airdrop munition released sarin that we know from the, just the, the, the debris. And then in one case, in one case, the journalist actually turns around and walks 20 meters in the opposite direction to the sarin dispersal and walks into a yard and shows the audience a dead goat. Now, I don't understand why this journalist wouldn't walk in the direction of the sarin dispersal and shown dead bodies all over the place. I mean, it's kind of crazy if that's what supposedly happened or walked into the area and said, walked into this other area and said, these are, this is where all these people died. They, instead, it's, it's, there's no indication at all that this adjacent area is, uh, is an area of mass death. Now, the only videos you can find that suggest that there are mass numbers of people poisoned are taken at uh, the Civil Defense Center, which is uh, a, a distance away. I can't, I don't know where it is, but it's it's a distance away from the um, uh, from the site where people would have been poisoned. Now, here's the problem you have there. I can place the time at which this video was taken. The video was taken at 8 o'clock a.m. We can, I can do this from the sun shadows. So this means within a half hour, a very large number of dead and dying, dead and dying, were transported to this civil defense shelter. Now, first thing you do is if, you're, if you come across a mass casualty scene and you're, you're, a, um, you're, you're trying to save people, you don't transport the dead to, to a hospital. You transport the living who look like you have a chance of saving. So at 8 o'clock, a half hour after this mass casualty scene should have occurred, which we have no data, uh, no reference to, uh, we have dead bodies and, and people who look like they have symptoms of some kind of poisoning all strewn around randomly at this supposed civil defense site, at least in the video. Now, one of the things you would do if you were operating a site like this is the first thing you want to do is separate the dead from the living because the living are the people you're going to try to save. So you'd have an area where you had bodies stacked who were, that were dead and you you had and then you'd have people in in an area where you could where uh, workers could walk through the crowd and identify people who are just too far beyond help and not do anything with them and relative to people who look like they can be saved you don't see any of that in this scene it's just people are strewn around randomly dead mixed with living uh, some of these people look like they may have actually been poisoned. Others, it's hard to know. So this is the evidence they have of a mass casualty scene. Now, I think there could have been mass casualties. Okay, so so there could have been mass casualties. And the evidence that's consistent with this possibility, I want to underscore, I do not know. But there is evidence consistent with the possibility of a mass casualty scene 
is one of the four explosions that were videoed when the attack occurred at around 7 a.m. There was a video of the expl- of the debris clouds from the explosions. One of the explosive clouds at its base was five at five times the area uh, of of the explosive cloud relative to the bases of the other three explosions. Now that strongly looks like that that was an ammunition dump that the Russians said were was hit because uh, if you if you dropped a bomb on uh, an ammunition stash, you would have had secondary explosions, and the area at the base of the you know the mushroom cloud that's created by the uh, uh, by the exploding device would you'd have all these secondary explosions, so the area would be a lot larger. So that could explain why the area was five times larger than the other three uh, explosions, and. Um, we know that a large amount of toxic materials can be created from just fire following one of these events. We don't know uh, if this was an ammunition depot. We don't know that there weren't chemicals stored there. There could have been precursor chemicals for nerve agents. But, you know, just things like uh, foam from furniture and uh, retardant, fire retardant materials and walls can combust to give you cyanide. And this is a big, this is a big uh, poisoning hazard when you have fires. You have carbon monoxide and cyanide and people downwind of this uh, gigantic explosion and debris cloud could readily be poisoned from the combustion products associated with, the, with this munition detonation. The wind was traveling very slowly, which means that the region of toxic gases would move very slowly and be persistent over a populated area that's adjacent to the ammunition site. These could well explain the casualties that were being shown at this civil defense center, but I just don't know. I, but none. The, the important thing is that the um, the White House report cannot possibly be correct based on their own cited evidence, which means that it cannot possibly have been properly reviewed by competent intelligence analysts. Because I know a lot of these people over the years, and they're far from stupid. They're quite capable. And uh, nobody competent would have said this, would have allowed this report to go out if they had any authorization over it. So we know that one story is false. The other story is possibly true. I I can't say it is true, but it's certainly consistent with with the evidence we can see from fragments of video. Mm -hmm. All right, now, I think you wrote about um, satellite pictures of the crater in the street and all that, But so that has me wondering whether there's satellite pictures of the building that seems to be the one of the four explosions that stood out is does that correlate with um, uh, the Russian claims? I mean, I know, for example, the Guardian reporter had said, well, here's the building. And obviously there were no munitions stored in here. But who said that was the building? It sounds like it was a different building altogether that was bombed. The one that the 14 year old girl mentioned to The New York Times. But I just in other words, do we ha- we have it narrowed down then right to the city block no, we, that we, needs we to be investigated? I, I've been trying to get a sense uh, of where uh, this building could be, but uh, I've searched um, fruitlessly through uh, all of the uh, stuff that's on the web looking for maybe someone published an aerial photograph or something. Hmm. There is none. There is, there, there is a pretty good uh, aerial image of the, um, of the crater that it was alleged alleged by the White House to be the sarin release point. And the reason for that was one of the journalistic teams that was out there had a drone that they, they flew to high altitude and looked down. And that gives quite a lot of detail uh, of the, uh, you know, of the scene uh, relative, you know, after the uh, crater was uh, generated. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's nothing 
about the you know with regard to this other area, which strikes me as rather peculiar. I mean, why would you have all these news people at this crater that almost looks silly when you had clearly had a, a major uh, explosion uh, in the in, in the city itself? And nobody with video of it up close. So I just find that peculiar. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I I I really don't know. In other words, uh, you know, one more piece of this is that Gareth Porter is saying uh, the the greatest reporter in the world is saying that he's got an intelligence source that says that the Russians did call ahead, just like they claim, called ahead on the deconfliction line and said, we're going to hit this storage depot i mean that would really throw cold water on the idea that they were planning on a gas attack that they would call america and and call it something else let them know about the attack but pretend it was going to be something else and then have a result in this gas thing just that doesn't seem very plausible but then again you know there's an accidental poison gas spill and then the white helmets and al-qaeda guys spring into action and frame up this thing and grab a pipe with a green stripe and and make it try to come up with this story about uh, this this uh, airdrop bomb that hit the crater in the road and and all this, you know. That, I mean, I guess it sounds like a busy morning. It's possible, but that sounds a little bit silly too. I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know either. I want to be very. I don't want to overstate. Yeah, I didn't mean to I, be uh, to no, accuse no, you or put words in your mouth either. No, I no, just, no. You know. But but I do think it's plausible. The reason it's plausible is because this area is tightly controlled by al-Qaeda, uh, al-Nusra, and whatever other elements are, are there. And uh, nobody is going to get away with filing a report that contradicts uh, what the line that they want to uh, project. Keep in mind that we only have you know, maybe a minute or two of video, which, um, which the media, mainstream media has used as if it were accurate. And we know it's not accurate. We, We don't know, we don't know what is true and what is not, but we absolutely know it is not accurate. We know that there was no sarin release. There's no evidence of a sarin release at that site. And we have, you know, reporters there and going going back and forth, people in the crater digging, uh, you know, pretty much not a good choice if, if there was a sarin release there. Um, and, you know, goats from the opposite direction of where the sarin went. No mention at all of the mass casualties that would have occurred if there was a sarin release at that site. Uh, you know, it, it does have the uh, a site, a, a civil defense site that looks entirely different from the kind of triage you would know you have to do if you're uh, if you're trying to handle a mass casualty situation, mm-hmm. you know, with bodies stacked in one place and the living uh, in a region where people can go through and, and pick them out. None of that. None of that. Yeah, so, I saw where uh, Bernard at the Moon of Alabama blog also pointed out that. One of the primary symptoms of sarin poisoning is the loss of all bowel control. And yet in all these pictures, the floor is clean, pants are clean, and there's no evidence that you have what, tens of people here all losing control of their bowels at the same time. And, and with these pictures, there's people stacked up, you know, living in debt, as you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's uh, a pretty big but, dog that didn't bark. If that, assuming that's really correct, that that's one of the first symptoms. But he seemed to know. Yeah, what the first thing that will happen is you'll start urinating, and, and you, you lose your urinate. You'd be urinating on yourself, and uh, yeah, and bowel, you know, your bowels would. Uh, so that seems would like a pretty spell. big. That seems like a pretty big hole in their theory, right there. If that's the few pictures they got have, you know, don't seem to corroborate that sort of loss of control at all. Yeah, the the only uh, the the only videos that I have seen that could indicate uh, nerve agent poisoning are, are of pinpoint pupils. You know, the uh, in, when they shine a light into uh, into the eye of a victim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw a clip like that too. But but uh, 
and, and that would be an indication of nerve agent uh, poisoning. The problem is you don't know where those videos came from. They're in a dark room with people around, you know, where is this from? Well, is that is that symptom exclusive of other types of poisoning if it had been chlorine or if it had been something else? Well, um, if it's hydrogen cyanide, the, the, the pupils would be uh, would tend to be dilated rather than pinpoint. Uh, but you could have had nerve agent mixed in. You know, you, you could have had a very inhomogeneous cloud of toxic material from this site because uh, we, it, it's absolutely true, unlike what the Americans seem to be now saying, that uh, the the rebel forces do have access to sarin precursors. We know that. And... Um, the UN has even made that point. Uh, so, so a sarin precursor, they they have to use any sarin that they make from the precursors has to be used relatively quickly because it will decay relatively quickly because they don't have the refined chemical uh, procedures for separating the sarin from other materials, uh, other chemicals that are generated in the process particularly hydrogen fluoride gas, which causes the breakdown of the sarin that's produced at the same time. So what you would do is you'd mix the precursors together. It would be um, a material called um, uh, methyl uh, phosphonyl difluoride is one of the precursors. That's very hard to make. but um, So that's, that's an exotic material, which we know they have. We don't know where they got them. Uh, got it, but uh, we know they have that. And they would then have isopropyl uh, alcohol uh, to mix with it. That's how they get the sarin. And you remember the source for that, how you know that they do have at least some of that precursor? Uh, there's a UN report. I I, I, uh, I just saw it referred to uh, that uh, came out uh, quite a while back. Uh, I do know that uh, people are reporting that intelligence in the U.S. uh had concluded that the rebels had um, uh, had precursors. Uh, there was a report by um, Seymour Hirsch that uh, precursors were given to uh, Al Nusra by uh, the Turkish Erdogan in Turkey because he was uh, hoping they would use it in a way that would implicate Assad, who he'd like to get rid of. Um, there was certainly powerful evidence from the um, 2013 attack in Damascus that rebels were likely a source of the of the actual attack. I can't say for sure, but uh, it doesn't look like it was was the Syrian government. I can't, again, I can't say for sure. Perhaps Bellingcat can say for sure, but. <laughs> Every all their evidence is nonsense. So I think so we all I, remember that they changed their theory about where the rocket was launched from three or four times to try to make it fit before everybody yeah, gave yeah. up on them. Yeah. Well, it, it's um, uh, there's very little doubt that uh, that there are amounts of sarin held by uh, uh, by by rebel elements, and um, would I guess, but I don't know again, is you could if you had sarin if you were plan, if you had sarin that, if you wanted to have the ability to use sarin, you would store it as the two precursor materials so for example this ammunition dump could have had drums of uh, precursor materials the explosions would shatter the drums they wouldn't necessarily burn the drums up because the explosions are very hot where the explosion actually occurs but most of the damage is done by by flying fragments and uh, and the pressure wave from the detonation point so you'd have these drums that are shattered or burst open and all this stuff would be on the floor reacting and so you could imagine that there would be traces of sarin in this debris cloud and if you were unlucky enough to be in the 
wrong location as this element of debris cloud came over you, you could be, you could suffer sarin poisoning. So it's not a it's not proof by any means. You know what though? But, it sounds like all of these different theories are all very provable if there was ever any kind of investigation, but I guess there just won't be. Well, I, I think there should be. And I think um all you need to do, all that needs to be done is to get the addresses of the people who were injured and killed. And that will tell you which story is right. If You'll either find this area adjacent to the dispersal crater, the alleged dispersal crater, which I think will be pristine. You won't find any problems there. Or an area next to this uh, alleged um, ammunition dump. And it won't be far away. It'll be right downwind. We know where, where to look. And if you get, if people were living in that area who are dead and uh, and injured, you know that it was the ammunition dump. You don't even need to do all this forensic analysis of exactly what was in the debris cloud, because you know the debris cloud is likely is almost is certainly toxic. It's certainly toxic. Whether there's sarin in it or not, that's a different. You know that that's to be determined. Mm-hmm. But it would certainly be a toxic cloud. We have industrial accidents from the past. We know the wind was moving slowly, which means the cloud moved over an area and stayed there. It was you know, as it took a long time to pass over the area, which means that people in that area were exposed for a significant uh, period of time as the cloud moved over them. So all we need is the address schedule. Well, not, yeah, not that's, a that's a very not good point. That's a very good point. Not rocket science. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. And, and uh, we'll so just call the Census Bureau and have them take care of it then. Right, right. All right. Um, all right. Any other major points that I should have thought of to ask you before I let you go here, sir? No, I think uh, I think we've pretty much covered uh, most okay. of what. Uh, all right. Well, let me important. say here, I think we have uh, the full collection of your series here um, appear appear to all be at Washington's blog, at washingtonsblog.com. Is there another place yes. where these are all going up first? You no, know, I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance. I'm just trying to look at things and try to... I see. They just go out to your email out list a... and whoever posts posts some kind of thing. Is right, that, right, I gotcha. exactly. exactly. Okay. Well, then, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and try to collect them all and post them up at the Libertarian Institute as well. So that would be fine. Very good. Okay, thank well, you. thank you very much for your time, sir. I really appreciate it. Happy to have done it. All right, y'all, that is Ted Postal, uh, Theodore Postal. You can find him uh, here at uns.com at Washington's blog. And I'm going to track down all these. I think Washington's blog has them all. I'm going to steal them from there and post them all up at the Institute for you guys to to read. Uh, The nerve agent attack that did not occur. That's one of them. And uh, the first is the nerve agent attack in Khan Shaikun, Syria. Uh, I'm Scott Horton. Check out scotthorton.org, libertarianinstitute.org, and twitter.com slash Scott Horton Show. Thanks, you guys. Hey, y'all. Scott Horton here for wallstreetwindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at wallstreetwindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com I love Bitcoin, but there's just something incredibly satisfying about having real, fine silver in your pocket. That's why commodity discs are so neat. They're one-ounce rounds of fine silver with a QR code on the back. Just grab your smartphone's QR reader, scan the coin, and you'll instantly get the silver spot price in Federal Reserve Notes and Bitcoin. And if you donate 100 bucks to The Scott Horton Show, he'll send you one. Learn more at Facebook.com slash Commodity Discs. CommodityDiscs.com